Chapter 9. The Sheep During the time Anush stayed with us, I heard political discussions of the highest order. It's incredible. The revolution is a leftist revolution, and the republic wants to be called Islamic. It's not important. Everything will turn out fine. In a country where half the population is illiterate, you cannot unite the people around Mark. The only thing that can really unite them is nationalism, or a religious ethic. But the religious leaders don't know how to govern. They will return to their mosques. The proletariat shall rule. It's inevitable. That's just what Lenin explained in The State and the Revolution. Sometimes I even told them my opinion. On TV, they say that 99.99% .99 of the population voted for the Islamic Republic. Did you hear that, Anush? Do you realize how ignorant our people are? The elections were faked, and they believe the results. 99.99%? .99 As for me, I don't know a single person who voted for the Islamic Republic. Where did that figure come from? From their asses, that's where. But it's not my fault. It's the TVs. Boo-hoo. Calm down, Ebby. She's just a child who repeats what she hears. Hey, want to play? He's going to the United States. To the United States? Why? My parents say it's impossible to live under an Islamic regime. It's better to leave. But the religious leaders are very stupid. They won't last. Yeah. My dad says nobody realizes the danger. So when are you leaving? In about a month. Oh, I think I really liked this boy. But the United States is terrific. You'll finally see Bruce Lee in person. Yeah, that would be nice. Bruce Lee is dead. Actually, I liked him very, very much. It was the end of the world. After my friend's departure, a good part of my family also left the country. Now boarding flight 6702 to Los Angeles, gate 26. Now boarding flight 6702 to Los Angeles, gate 26. Maybe we should leave too. So that I can become a taxi driver and you a cleaning lady? My friend Kavai left for the United States too. Don't worry, everyone who left will come back. They're just afraid of change. Let's hope so. I'm really frightened, Anush. Don't be, Taji. It's like this with all revolutions. This is just a transitional period. Ring, ring. Dad, it's for you. What? What's going on? What is it? Dad? Your mother died? It's Mosin. He's been found dead, drowned, in his bathtub. What? Where? Murderers! Murderers! My mother was right to believe it was murder. When they found his body, only his head was underwater. Everything will be all right. After motion, it was Simic's turn. Is this Simic Hari's house? Yes. We are the deliverers of divine justice. His sister was executed in his place. Do you know where Simic and his family are now? No more than you do, but they must surely have hidden somewhere. And Lolly? Later on, we learn they crossed the border, hidden among a flock of sheep. Everything will be all right. And that is how all the former revolutionaries became sworn enemies of the Republic. Wasn't Anush going to pick me up? What? Wasn't he supposed to come? Well, yes. He went back to Moscow. What? Oh, no. That old tale about being on a trip had come back. He had to leave quickly. His wife called him. He asked me to tell you goodbye. He doesn't even talk to his wife. Darling, did you have a good day at school? He must be hungry. Where's Anush? Don't you want to eat a little? I'm not hungry. Why didn't he stay to say goodbye to me? He was in a hurry, a big hurry. I think we need to talk. God, don't let him be dead. The truth is, they have arrested Anush. I know. Daddy. Yes, my baby. Do you want to do something for him? Yes. Anush has the right to only one visitor, and it's you he wants to see. 
Do you think I'm dressed nicely enough? Of course. We're almost there. Ten minutes. What a beautiful dress. What a beautiful girl. You know, you have honored me with your visit. You are the little girl I always wanted to have. But you'll see, one day the proletariat will rule. Here, I made you another bread swan. It's the uncle of the first one. Star of my life. That was my last meeting with my beloved Anush. Russian spy executed. Everything will be all right. Margie, what seems to be the problem? Shut up, you. Get out of my life. I never want to see you again. Get out. And so I was lost, without any bearings. What could be worse than that? Margie, run to the basement. We're being bombed. It was the beginning of the war. Chapter 10, The Trip Oh, shit. They've occupied the U.S. Embassy. Who's they? Who do you think? The fundamentalist students have taken the Americans hostage. Really? They call it a nest of spies. Ha ha. You'd think it was a James Bond movie. You're not interested? I couldn't care less. Anyway, the Americans are dummies. Maybe, but now no one can go to the United States. Why's that? Think about it. No embassy, no visa. So my great dream went up in smoke. I wouldn't be able to go to the United States. Kavai, they closed the U.S. Embassy today. I won't be able to come and see you. The dream wasn't the USA. It was seeing my friend Kavai, who had left to go live in the United States a year earlier. And then some days later, the Ministry of Education has decreed that universities will close at the end of the month. Oh no. The educational system and what is written in school books at all levels are decadent. Everything needs to be revised to ensure that our children are not led astray from the true path of Islam. Of course. Of course. That's why we're closing all the universities for a while. Better to have no students at all than to educate future imperialists. Thus, the universities were closed for two years. You'll see soon, they're actually going to force us to wear the veil, and you'll have to trade your car for a camel. God, what a backward policy. A camel? No more university, and I wanted to study chemistry. I wanted to be like Marie Curie. I wanted to be an educated, liberated woman, and if the pursuit of knowledge meant getting cancer, so be it. It's I who discovered the newest radioactive element. And so, another dream went up in smoke. Misery. At the age that Marie Curie first went to France to study, I'll probably have ten children. One night, your mother's car broke down. We have to pick her up. Mom? Ebby. Two guys. Two bearded guys. Two fundamentalist bastards. The bastards. The bastards. They... Calm down, darling. Calm down. What did they do? Mom? They insulted me. They said that women like me should be pushed up against a wall and effed and then thrown in the garbage. And that if I didn't want that to happen, I should wear the veil. Forget about those morons. Let's go home. That incident made my mother sick for several days. Anything I can get you, Mom? And so to protect women from all the potential rapists, they decreed that wearing the veil was obligatory. Women's hair emanates rays that excite men. That's why women should cover their hair. If, in fact, it is really more civilized to go without the veil, then animals are more civilized than we are. Incredible. They think all men are perverts. Of course, because they really are perverts. In no time, the way people dressed became an ideological sign. There were two kinds of women, the fundamentalist women, the modern women. You showed your opposition to the regime by letting a few strands of hair show. There were also two sorts of men, the fundamentalist man, beard, shirt hanging out, the progressive man, shaved with or without a mustache, shirt tucked in, 
Islam is more or less against shaving. But let's be fair. If women faced prison when they refused to wear the veil, it was also forbidden for men to wear neckties, that dreaded symbol of the blessed. And if women's hair got men excited, the same thing could be said of men's bare arms, and so wearing short-sleeved shirts was also forbidden. There was a kind of justice after all. It wasn't only the government that changed, ordinary people changed too. Look at her. Last year she was wearing a miniskirt, showing off her beefy thighs to the whole neighborhood. And now Madame is wearing a shador. It suits her better, I guess. As for her fundamentalist husband, who drank himself into a stupor every night, now he uses mouthwash every time he utters the word alcohol. And their son says he prays every day. If anyone ever asks you what you do during the day, say you pray. You understand? Okay. At first it was a little hard, but I learned a lot quickly. I pray five times a day. Me? Ten or eleven times, sometimes twelve. In spite of everything, the spirit of the revolution was still in the air. There was some opposition, demonstrations. Tomorrow, there's going to be a meeting against fundamentalism. I'm coming too. No, it's too dangerous. She's coming too. She should start learning to defend her right as a woman right now. Since the 1979 revolution, I'd grown older. Well, a year older. And mom had changed. So I went with them. I passed out flyers. Guns may shoot and knives may carve, but we won't wear your silly scarves. When suddenly things got nasty. The scarf or a beating. For the first time in my life, I saw violence with my own eyes. Dad? That was our last demonstration. Every man for himself. Things got worse from one day to the next. In September 1980, my parents abruptly planned a vacation. I think they realized that soon such things would no longer be possible. As it happened, they were right. And so we went to Italy and Spain for three weeks. It was wonderful. Right before going back in the hotel room in Madrid, look at this. The TV showed a map of Iran and a black cloud covering the country little by little. What in the world is this? Too bad we don't know Spanish. Maybe they're talking about pollution. You know, Tehran is the fourth most polluted city in the world. It looks like they're talking about the whole country, not just the capital. The next day, my grandmother came to pick us up at the airport. Grandma, I got you a black dress. She looked worried. Everything okay, Mom? Yes. Oh, I'm taking this thing off. It's too hot. It's good to be back. There's no place like home. True, but soon there'll be no home. Why do you say that? You haven't heard? Haven't heard what? We're at war. What? They only officially announced it two days ago. But really, it's been a month. The Iranian fundamentalists tried to stir up their Iraqi Shiite allies against Saddam. He's been waiting for the chance. He always wanted to invade Iran. And here's the pretext. It's the second Arab invasion. The second invasion in 1400 years. My blood was boiling. I was ready to defend my country against these Arabs who kept attacking us. I wanted to fight.